Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video number two. This is examples of natural selection. In the first video I talked specifically about what natural selection is and how it can affect a gene pool. In this one I'm going to talk about real world examples of evolution and natural, natural selection taking place right now. Um, I wanted to start by showing you this picture of Glacier National Park. What's interesting and a little sad about Glacier National Park is over the next few years all of the glaciers will actually melt. And the reason why is that the earth is getting warmer um, and as a result of that it's impacting the glaciers and it'll impact the living things in Glacier National Park as well. So this right here are glacier lilies that come out right after the snow moves away and so plants across the world are having to adapt to these changing uh, climates. So that's a, an example of real world uh, evolution. I always like to start with kind of a overlay of what we're going to talk about in this podcast. Um, natural selection, remember, causes evolution. Uh, what's neat about it, it's different than um, random events that cause evolution. What's interesting about natural selection is it actually creates organisms that are better adapted to their environment. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how changes to the environment, especially climate changes right now, are affecting life on our planet. Next, I want to briefly talk about how mutations can cause changes in phenotype and those gene changes can have huge uh, implications when it comes to organisms. Some of those make big phenotype or physical changes. Some don't make any changes at all. Next, I'll talk about how those phenotypes or those changes can actually affect uh, the fitness of organisms. And so there was one mutation in uh, the protein that makes blood that actually created sickle cell anemia and that was bad but it also saved millions of lives in protecting them from malaria. And then finally I want to talk about another environmental change and that's the environmental change that is humans and how we're impacting evolution on the planet right now. A really scary example of that would be uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, bacteria that were once curable, cur curable but aren't anymore. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I wanted to start with poet, naturalist, uh, Henry David Thoreau. Um, what's interesting about him, uh, he lived on, on Walden Pond, and if you've read any of his work, it's, it's really inspirational, and uh, he's an amazing um, writer. But what's interesting is we're actually able to use some of his work to show evolution and natural s selection taking place. Because most people know that he was a writer, but most people don't know is that he was a naturalist as well. And so he would study... For example, St. John's wort and blueberries, and he would detail when they would flower, and we can use that data to show how climate is actually affecting plants. And so here's a quote where he's talking about uh, in 1853 how the blueberry buds were starting to come out, and we've got a date, and so we can actually look at that. And so let me give you an example of that. So let's say we've got the blueberry, and it is flowering on the 7th of April back in 1853. So if this is 1853, now maybe this is the first blueberry, but this bell-shaped curve represents when all the blueberries on Walden Pond were coming out. Now, if you were a blueberry and you were to come out earlier than that, there would probably be snow. There wouldn't be anything to help you flower or, or transfer that pollen. And if you were to come out later than that, then you probably wouldn't survive as well. And so the average blueberries would probably start to flower around the early part of April. Now what's happened since then is that the uh, climate has changed. And so if we look now in 2011, it's going to be much warmer on April 7th than it was in 1853. And so the blueberries that were able to come out a little bit earlier uh, have done fine. And so if we were to look at the bell-shaped curve of blueberries today, we would find that it's probably shifted quite a bit and things are flowering earlier just because the climate is getting warmer and warmer. And if you were to blueberry right now and to uh, flower really, really late, you'd be behind the ball. You'd be way behind. And so what we've seen is directional selection. In other words, that bell-shaped curve has moved. Nice thing about the work of uh, Thoreau is that we can actually quantify that because we can see what days it's, it's changing today. Next, I wanted to talk specifically about phenotypes. Remember, phenotypes are going to be the physical characteristics that you have. But remember, all changes, all novel changes in organisms comes from changes in their DNA. So when we get changes in the base pairs or in the bases inside that DNA, that eventually leads to things uh, like the way we look. So this is a type of mollusk. It's a Donux uh, variabilis, and it has a number of different uh, patterns that come from uh, one species of, of mollusk. These ones live in the sand and you can see how genes have added this striation and then it also looks like there's a gene that's adding these uh, vertical striations as well. And so those phenotypes started as a mutation or a change in the DNA 
but it ends up changing the physical appearance. And if it wasn't for all this variety, all these different types of, of shells, then natural selection wouldn't work. In other words, if all organisms look the same, um, then there'd be nothing for them to select. Okay, let me talk about an example of this in, uh, found in humans. This right here is the most dangerous animal that we have on our planet, the Anopheles mosquito. And the reason it's dangerous is it passes a disease called malaria. And you can see where malaria is found in sub-Saharan Africa. It's killed millions and millions of people. Now, we would say thousands of years ago, I can't remember on the specific day, there was a mutation in one person uh, who lived maybe in Africa. And that mutation caused a red blood cell that normally looks like this, to be made like that. It's a change in one letter of the DNA which affects the hemoglobin protein inside the blood. And so you get a sickle-shaped red blood cell. Now this is very painful if you're sickle cell anemic, causes organ failure, it's a really bad disease to have. What's interesting about it is if you are heterozygous for that, in other words, if you have two genes for it, you're gonna have sickle cell anemia. But if you only have one, you can't get malaria. So you're protected from malaria. And so here we had one mutation which caused one of phenotype change or one change in the blood which protected them against malaria. So what we see is natural selection in humans. In other words, this is where sickle cell gene is found. So right here in the darker areas, uh, greater than 20% of the people have that sickle cell, disease, uh, sickle cell gene. And the reason they do here is that they're protected against malaria. But again, if you lived here and you had that sickle cell disease where malaria is not present, that would actually be a negative. And so you can see how natural selection is at play. But first you had to have that mu mutation. First you had to have that change. Uh, last thing is kind of a warning call, and, and humans are starting to figure out that we can really have huge impacts on the organisms that live on our planet. And the example here I'm talking about is tuberculosis, or TB. Uh, tubercul tuberculosis has killed humans for years and years and years. This would be a good way to, to uh, diagnose it. You look at a chest x-ray, and you can see that the bacteria are actually feeding on the lungs, and this would be the bacteria right here. They're a, a, a cock, or excuse me, a rod-shaped kind of bacteria. Tuberculosis has been around since humans, pretty much way back in the day of the, of the pharaohs, we had tuberculosis. And so what we did is we discovered that you can kill tuberculosis using uh, antibiotics. And so if somebody has tuberculosis, we give them antibiotics. It kills all the bacteria, except those that are highly resistant. We then take another dose, we take another dose, and if we quit taking it, what we end up with, if we can't kill all the bacteria, is we end up with highly resistant uh, bacteria. And so we've created a disease, multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, and what that is, is a form of tuberculosis that is resistant to sometimes a dozen different antibiotics that humans have created. And so that's a human-made problem. And so who's doing the selecting? Well, we are. And that's why it's important when you take antibiotics that you don't take them unless you really need them. And when you do take antibiotics that you take them until um, the course is run it's, uh, all the way through. Um, we're seeing some nasty types of multidrug resistant tuberculosis. This person is actually be treat being treated in Russia, um, where lots of times they don't get complete treatment and we're just spawning these diseases, they'll get worse and worse. Um, the sad part about that is all these diseases that we once had a cure to, uh, we don't anymore. And, and the reason why is that um, natural selection and us are actually creating this problem. And so those are some examples of natural selection and evolution. I hope that's helpful.